Well, let's talk about God's church this morning. Because after all, our sign says Intercommunity Church of God, right? Connected with the Association of the Church of God in Southern California and Southern Nevada. We take part in the activities of the Interstate Association of the Church of God, which covers five Western states. Uh, and also the National Association of the Church of God, which is the um, fellowship of largely African-American congregation, which meets in Pennsylvania. And for identity and for basic purposes of identity and shared understandings, we are participants in the General Assembly of the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, which has a 125 year history in various locations. And for the time being, the church is a little bit, our, our founding of the church is 1880, but the General Assembly began to meet together after that. For the time being, we do not expect uh, Anderson, Indiana to host our annual or now semi-annual General Assembly meetings again for logistical reasons. Uh, so for organizational purposes, however, as well as to multiply the work of the church to train and support and send missionaries and to manage or oversee some important ministries for children and orphans around the world, we're contributors to the to Church of God Ministries, which is the top rung of our legal identity. There's just a little bit of Church of God in those associations and those identities. That's because we share a common vision, we serve a common understanding of the church and the Bible, and we wish to have a significant impact in our local communities and in our region, our nation, and the world. So we can't really say what we used to say uh, 15 years ago, which was, uh, we are the Church of God Reformation Movement with general offices in Anderson, Indiana. Not anymore, not quite. Our primary university and graduate school of theology is still Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana. The zip code for Church of God Ministries is still technically Anderson, Indiana, but is a unique zip code for our university and our offices. But the offices are in a building that sits well outside of Anderson, but still in north central Indiana, a bit north of Indianapolis. Now, I just took three or four minutes of your time for the, of the time for this message and didn't really say anything about the Church of God. I only talked about the various connections we share as congregations of the local church bodies who are a part of our tribe, as our general director, Jim Lyon, calls us, of the Church of God. Um, and for the month of September, I'm using the theme God's Church Is, and we're starting today with the first focus we need to know, that God's Church is one church. Our understanding of the church is that it is the body of Christ, so it cannot be divided in reality, even though it often is in practical uh, expression. Well, we'll be talking about that and why it's important today. Next week, September 11th, we'll look at uh, God's church is a Bible-centered church. Then on September 18th, God's church is called to holiness, and we'll round it out on September 25th with God's church lives in God's kingdom now. That's kind of good news all by itself as well. Those four topics are not going to exhaust the reasons why we gladly take up the name Church of God and why the name is not a matter for pride, but a matter of fact. And it is the way that the Bible describes the body of Christ gathered together in any particular place. In fact, many of the letters to Paul, by Paul and by um, John and Peter were written to a particular church. So Paul would often say, to the church of God in Corinth to the church of God in uh, Galatia. You know, he wrote to the church in a particular place, all church of God, all gathered in a particular place. So as we prepare to dive into the details of why we can say that God's church is truly one church, let's look at a short passage that has our basic description of why God's church is one church. And um, uh, let's see, it's first described in Acts chapter 2. As the day of Pentecost saw the power of the Holy Spirit descend on some 120 disciples of Jesus Christ who were um, 
praying and waiting for the power from on high to come upon them, just as Jesus had promised, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So stay in Jerusalem until you're endued with power on high, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and uh, basically everywhere because of that power. So here it is. They were in Jerusalem 50 days after the day of Passover, for which Jesus was our Passover lamb. The church of the living God was birthed by the power of the Holy Spirit on that day, probably about the year 33 at the spring harvest, when thousands of Jewish pilgrims were streaming into Jerusalem to present their offerings of first fruits at the temple. Now, first fruits, that's a commanded feast from the Old Testament. The scribes and the priests had established that it was to take place 50 days after Passover, so people would know when to get over, when to gather. And so Pentecost is a word that just means 50th day. Well, not really very exciting as a title for a holiday, 50th day. What are you doing today? Oh, 50th day stuff. Oh, that, that's basically what the word Pentecost means all by itself. Simply that. And it was, it's a Jewish holiday. We've taken that word to, to identify the Holy Spirit coming, coming upon the members of God's church. But it was a Jewish holiday that, that continued as long as the temple was there. That uh, um, title uh, isn't very exciting. We don't really do any better. I mean, after all, today is Labor Day weekend and every mom out there cringes at what that might actually mean. And a smaller percentage of workers are unionized these days and they rarely put on parades anymore. But this is our Labor Day weekend. And then we have Thanksgiving, which just is a normal word and Christians uh, Christmas, which just means a mass on Christ's day in English. For Catholics, mass means the central celebration, of the Lord's Supper, uh, when they're gathered in worship. But it's interesting that the word mass itself comes merely from the last words in the Latin lit liturgy. This is kind of a cute little add-on here, which are sort of an amen and, and go away. Uh, it comes from missa est, which means the end is here, go away. We're finished. The liturgy's over. And so from that Missa S. Kem's Mass in English, which we celebrate, which the Christian or the Catholic Church uses to describe their celebration of the Eucharist day by day and week by week. Uh, so um, anybody who feels a little bit done with uh, everything that's been added on to how we do Christmas can really understand how it might be a good time to say, well, Christ Day is finished, now go home. Um, but we might know how that feels, but we actually don't say that, would we? Well, New Year's Day, yeah, there's another really exciting sound for a holiday. Anyway, back to Pentecost. On that day, the Church of God in Christ Jesus was born uh, as, the, as 120 believers were gathered together in prayer. And giant, the great wind came and tongues of fire uh, uh, rested upon them. And suddenly they could speak and hear in all the languages that were gathered there. They were... Uh, at first, the church was the word church wasn't applied to them. They were just a gathering. They were just a fellowship of believers in Jesus as the Christ. Church is our translation of the Greek word ecclesia, which means those who are called to a meeting. So it's much easier to say church, I think, than to speak of those whom the Holy Spirit has called out of the world as sinners to be gathered among those who are made saints by the saving grace and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We'll just use the word church. That works better for us anyway. And we'll talk about how that continues to look for us as we go on with this. But I want you to know that the important thing is that God's church gets a God start in all of this. It's not just the design of humanity, but it is the purpose of God. On that first day, uh, following the rousing sermon of Peter and the other apostles, if you go ahead and read Acts chapter 2, verse 14, it says that the 11 stood up with him as he spoke. So I think there was a little more preaching going on than just what we have recorded from Peter on that day. But on that day, Acts 2.41 says 3,000 believers were added from 12 to 120 to 3,000 in seven weeks. Pretty amazing, really. And it had to be God doing that the church got a God start. And 
this new fellowship was pretty exciting. It was pretty intense. There was teaching and meals and prayers and miracles and people losing their selfishness and sharing their wealth. And so as, here's how we read it in Acts 2, 46 to 47. I use the New King James Version just because the King James uses the word church in verse 47. Others just say to their number, to their fellowship. So Acts 2, 46 and 47, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Well, when you suddenly get that size of a fellowship, what are you going to do? Well, you're going you're gonna to probably do what they did. They spent every day together in the temple. So um, every day together in the temple, that's the place of gathering. That's a place they had that where they could be. Uh, it makes sense. There wasn't any place else that would both accommodate that many and remind them of the sacrifice for sin that is complete in Christ Jesus. Then we also have that they were sharing meals in their homes. They were also meeting house to house. They were having fellowship meals. They were thank they they were meeting with thankful hearts and a simple faith. And it says that they were praising God. This became not just a feature of their gathering, but a feature of their lifestyle. It's the core reason to come together to believers, to lift your voice in praise, to, to multiply the praise you can give to God as you come together in a fellowship, to praise the one who loved you so much he sent his one and only son as your savior. I expect they were making a lifestyle of praise wherever they went. And then a little surprisingly, right here in this verse, it says they were being good citizens. Well, that's a little surprising. I'll tell you why in a moment. But they were finding favor with all the people. It doesn't even sound like they were following the teacher that had the most radical faith that the world has ever known. That would, a faith that would change um, them. And their favor with all the people would change in just a bit when they started to turn the world on its ear with their radical faith in a radical savior. But right here, Acts 2, 47, it was, um, it was very simply that they were praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church every day those who are being saved. Now, um, this is important because it tells us some important things about the church. First is that God keeps the roll call. God knows who's on the list. Uh, because we read in one of our, as we read this, in the church of God, this is one of our primary beliefs about membership in God's church. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. We don't keep the role. We don't keep the list. Every day, the Lord adds to our number those who are being saved. Now, only God can tell you how many members are in his church. It's not our head count. It's not our list of voting members. It's not our families coming together in one place once a week or once a month or so. It's not the church gathered in local associations. It's not the church gathered in national associations. It's not any of that. The church is those, all those who are being saved. Day by day, the Lord adds to the number. The membership of God's church happens like this. First, you hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus' forgiveness and saving grace. Second, you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You confess your sins. You ask God to come into your life, and then bang, God adds you to the church. It's just like that. Now, Peter mentioned the word baptism as he said, repent and be baptized, all of you. Uh, baptism is important. It's our identity with Jesus in his own baptism. But uh, this means that God's, God knows who is saved. God knows who is saved. We guess at it. Sometimes we aren't even real sure of ourselves, but the scripture also has special promises for us that has to do with belief in that uh, um, uh, Jesus is the son of God and that he, uh, God raised him from the dead on the third day. Believe in these things. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You shall be saved. That's a promise. John's, uh, in the Gospel of John, it's simply about um, uh, everyone who believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe. 
is the core. But the truth is, the transformation that happens when we move from being part of the world to part of God's family, all of that is God's work inside. So only God can truly know who is saved. And the second then is only saved people are in God's church. Now, anybody can come to church as we have it today. In fact, we want anybody to come. We want everyone to come. We like having a gathered church inside these four walls. But as you look around, these are barriers to the outside world. All of these world, all these walls and all of these shades drawn on our windows are keeping the world out and keeping us in. Well, that's not quite the picture of God's church. Uh, but within these walls, we have opportunity to, to teach and to learn, to grow and to fellowship and to be prepared to go out into the world. God knows who is saved. Only saved people are in God's church. And here's the last part of that is all the saved people are in God's church. Not just the ones we like, not just the ones we identify with, not just the ones we would have picked out of the crowd, but all of those who are saved by the power of the Holy Spirit through the blood of Christ, the forgiveness bought by the love of God who sent his son. All the saved people are in God's church. That's the basic outline of what the Bible tells us that the church is. Now, on a human level, our gatherings aren't so homogenous as we would like to think. We're, we, we, don't, uh, we don't know if everyone has had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. We are familiar with the fact that not everyone has stayed faithful to the commands of God. Not everyone is interested in doing things differently than they would, than they would do it on their own. And that means that because of sin and selfishness among believers and others who aren't sincere in their faith, you see, those who come to a meeting like this, they might not be believers. They might not want to be believers. They might want to just stir up trouble. The devil likes to do things like that to us. But that all means that our modern church is fractured. As many as 40,000 Christian group identities in the world. And that's not God's design. People are good at finding out what defines them as different from someone else. In fact, the Church of God movement has often talked about what makes us different. Well, People are good at looking down on anyone who doesn't believe the same way that they believe, or doesn't have the same standards as we have, or does church or church music differently than we do. Sometimes it feels like a life and death struggle for the souls of the church and the souls of other people. Other times it's about if it's okay to serve coffee at church, or if it's okay to eat meat, or if it's okay to wear a long tie when you're when you are uh, come to worship? Is it okay to be a soldier or must you be a pacifist? Whatever it might be, the push and pull of humanity and standards and everything else forgets the reality that all the saved people are in God's church. That cannot change by the way we practice church. But in this modern church, we are so fractured and we might ask how did the church get like this well it's because people are really good at alienating themselves from others with name calling with mistrust with gossip with grudges with preferences and downright racism if you're not like me and nice about it you're not one of us that's kind of the way we live our lives that's the way we go well I want you to know that Jesus knew that we were going to struggle with this. Jesus knew that you can't put 17 people together. He had 12 people that, that uh, were pushing and shoving. You remember, uh, as they're moving toward these last days of Jesus, how the mother of uh, the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus and said, hey, hey, Jesus, tell you what, in your kingdom, why don't you put one of my sons at your right hand and one at the left? And the rest of the, the, rest of the disciples kind of got a grudge about that. And then even at the end of the Gospel of John, where we have the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, uh, it, it was overheard uh, something that Jesus said that caused the other disciples to say, hey, Jesus said that John would live until he returns. Well, no, Jesus just said he might. <laughs> um, this tells uh, the beloved disciple tells us in his own gospel, but People take offense at one another. It's recorded in that place that even the disciples right uh, soon after the 
there before the crucifixion were already struggling with that. Well, why wouldn't they? You had a tax collector, you had a zealot. Now, those guys are already at each other's throats in the political world. That is the right and the left side of things. And uh, that was the tax collector who was on the collecting money for the Roman occupiers and the zealot whose band would try and find ways to, um, well, let's see, be guerrilla soldiers against the Romans. So already they're at each other's necks. You have, um, you have fishermen largely from Galilee, but among those, you had those who were younger and those who were older, those who were business owners and those who were just fishermen. You had those who were um, uh, pure of heart and those who were struggling day by day by day. All of that was a reality just in the 12 disciples, the apostles that Jesus called and named, even one of those who would betray him. Jesus knew we would struggle. And so in his prayer in John 17, he prays for himself, he prays for those who are gathered around him. And then in verse 20, it says, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may know, that the world may believe you sent me. Well, it's important to know that, that our struggle to try and maintain unity is not new to Jesus, the one who saved us. There will be a struggle. Jesus started praying for us before he went to the cross. He started praying for you and for me, those who believe through the word of those faithful through all of these ages, generation after generation after generation. Each of us who are saved heard the gospel from someone. Each of us who are saved believed the gospel as the Holy Spirit visited us. Each of us who are saved was added to God's church right there, right then, and we are part of God's church, each of us who is saved. Now, that's black, white, green, blue, wherever you live, anything. If God adds you to the church, it's because you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But with all of our ways of looking at one another, our ways of shunning each other, our ways of turning our back on those who are different than us, we have to realize that it's important for us to focus on unity. Jesus prayed for our unity, that we would be one. And he says, "May in verse 21, may they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. So he prays that this be true based in the unity of the Father and Son. I am in them, they are in me. Father, I am in you. There's only one God, there's an, only one Lord. I'll talk about the ones in just a moment, but we are called to be one in Jesus as his disciples. That's the vision of the church that God had. And we might ask, have you seen the church? Now, my brother, Bob Bixler, he, Pastor Bob, he knows this phrase so well. Have you seen the church? And we, we used to talk about that in, in, in the olden days. You know, I'm old enough now that I've been part of the Church of God for uh, over 60 years myself. And have you seen the church? Have you seen the church? What does it mean to see the church? Well, yeah, I see the buildings. I see the people that gather. But have you seen the church? Have you gotten a grasp on the fact that God knows who are saved? Everyone who's saved is part of the church. Have you seen the church? Because there is only one church, regardless of how fractured it might look to the outside world. Have you seen the church? Have you come to the point where you can reach your hand in fellowship to every blood-washed one? Everyone saved by the blood of Jesus Christ is the church. Everyone, everyone, everyone. Sometimes we have to say whether you like it or not, everyone. Have you seen it? It's a great vision when you suddenly know that everyone saved by the blood of Christ, no matter their language, no matter their culture, no matter their color, no matter their nationality, no matter which side they are on in politics or what side they are on in war, everyone saved by the blood of Christ is 
part of the church. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? To be one in Jesus as his disciples. Jesus went on to pray and said in John 17, 22 to 23, I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them, you are in me, so that they may be made completely one. It says in the Christian Standard Version, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You see, when we see the church, we see people Jesus loves. Now we see those who ought to be in the church, we need to have eyes of love, eyes of Christ that, that sees every human as somebody of so much value that God sent his only son to die on the cross for that pile of flesh, regardless of who they are. Everyone worthy of salvation because none of us is on our own. Each of us only a sinner condemned to die. Each of us only a saint by the purifying blood of Christ. And each of us brought into the church by the power and the purpose of God. Be one based on the glory of God. To be perfectly one, completely one. To make that connection. So that, that wouldn't it be wonderful if the whole world got it? Actually, wouldn't it be wonderful if we who call ourselves the church of God got it? Because this last year, there was a challenge between the Black Fellowship, the National Association of the Church of God. Some of the pastors there were, were uh, pushing against the identity of the Church of God, mostly white, and the political realities and the beliefs and the voting changes and everything else. And it looked like nobody was standing on the side of the black believer or the black church in the church of God. And there was actually a motion to withdraw. It was defeated. It was talked about. They discussed it deeply and thoroughly. It's a real challenge because the black church of God wants to be part of us in reality. And as the white church of God, we need to want them to be. We need to connect to whether it's Asian or Indian, whether it's uh, Native American, whether it's uh, Scandinavian or whether it's Italian or whether it's African or whether it's Indian, whether it's Chinese or Japanese, whether it's Islander or whether it's West Coaster, whatever it might be. We need to understand that everyone saved by the blood of Christ is the church, everyone, 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 everyone. To realize that is to be perfectly one. Now, it's hard work. It's hard work. It's the work of God in us. And if it's not the work of God in us, we will fail. We have to have that power of God in us. We have to have that sense of God saving us so that in 1 John chapter 3, the verse I use so often, how blessed we are to be called the children of God. And that's what we are. Now, that was written to, so that every Christian everywhere, by, by John, a, a Galilean um, Jewish man who happened to serve the Christian church, he is the one who wrote that for us. Well, it's the work of God in us. And we will fail if we don't have that work active. Have you seen the church? Do you know what the Bible means when it says the church? Scripture just told us, Acts 2.47. You can go back to it anytime you want to know what the church is. The Lord adds daily to the number everyone who is being saved all around the world, all the time. Now, we need to know something though in this because being in, um, being in communion with others is hard. It's hard. We have differences of opinion. We have differences in what temperature we want the sanctuary to be. We have differences in what color we want the carpet to be. We have differences in whether it's okay to fellowship with other people or whether it's okay to buy your groceries in a store that sells liquor. Boy, you remember the old days, Bob? We'd never do that, right? You would, if there was liquor being sold in that store, then you didn't buy your food there. 
Well, these days in California, you can't avoid it. Um, so you either grow your own food or go hungry, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, we set standards like that, which were standards of separation, not the same as the world. Well, you know what? The Bible says that unity is worth, worth the effort, and it says it in Ephesians chapter 4. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, says Paul, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you've received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Unity is work, but it's worth the effort. Connection with one another is work, but it's worth the effort. Being part and knowing you are part of all those other Christians is a marvelous understanding. And knowing that you are part of every other Christian is how you break down barriers. That's how the dividing wall that's talked about in Ephesians chapter 2 is broken down, knowing that you are part of every other one. To be perfectly one is a work of God in us. And when we see the church, we will know that unity is worth the effort. And here's a list of ones that, that, that help to tie us together coming up in chapter four of Ephesians, verses four through six. These ones should remind us that we are one church in everything. Uh, Paul says it this way, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope at your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, who is above all and in all and through all. One body, that's the body of Christ. That's what the church is called. One spirit that infills every believer. One hope of salvation, uh, of, of, of living forever, eternal life because of what Christ has given us. One Lord who is Jesus himself. There is only one son of God who died on the cross for our salvation. One faith, and that is that very simply, Jesus died on the cross for our salvation. And if we accept that forgiveness and we seek to follow his words, we are part of him. There's one baptism, one baptism that says, I have entered the church. I have entered the church because I am saved. I am saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ, only one and only one God and Father, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, because the body of Christ is singular, is singular. It's the primary thought of what the church is like in the mind of Paul, who tells us in Ephesians that the gifts of leadership, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers are given the task of building up the one body of Christ so it can be what God intends. And so Paul says all this leadership is given in the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry, to build up that body of Christ until we all reach unity. It's work, it's building up, it's focus. But we use, reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Now, that's the Christian standard um, version of that. But, but look at the end of that. Growing into maturity with a standard that is Christ's. It's Christ's standard, not ours. We want to be equipped to the, do the work of ministry, exercising for strength, the body of Christ, looking forward to unity and faith, to the, by the knowledge of Jesus Christ, by maturity measured by all that Christ is. So we ask, how are you doing? How are we doing? How's the church doing with that? We face some of our strongest challenges and it will continue. Fellowship has been damaged. Hearts have been broken. Progress have been reversed. Racism is trying to divide us. But we must put aside everything that is not from God to be all that God wants us to be. Division is the outcome of hate, but unity is the outcome of love. And that just feels good to say it, quite honestly. Division is the outcome of hate, but unity is the outcome of love. I don't know if it strikes you when you say it, but it strikes me. It, it goes right to my heart. To the disciples in the upper room, Jesus 
Jesus said, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, unity is the outcome of love. Over and over, I've shared this command because love is the heart of God. Love is the action of Jesus Christ right through the cross. And love is the command given to us, his church, to love one another just as I have loved you love one another. Everyone else will notice and know who you are. If love is not our hallmark, unity can't be what we present to others. Love is the modifying force. Love is the heavenly command. Love is what forms us as belonging to Jesus. And that's why Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Where there is love, there is peace, and that is the peace of Christ. Now, I have uh, another page here which is, that uh, I'm going to not share this morning, but I want you to look at Colossians chapter 3. Uh, I'll just read the verses there. I just read 3.14, um, but I want to read 3.15 as well. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. In the one body of Christ, we can only make it work through the miracles of the love of God in us, the love of Christ practiced by seeking the peace of Christ in our fellowship. Peace, not battles. Peace is ruined by blind ambition. It's ruined by grasping at position or personal rights, and most specifically by gossip and backbiting. The message is not about that. Peace is, is simply the managing philosophy of what we're to bring about for oneness. The church is made up of every saved individual, everyone washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, everyone living as saints because the Holy Spirit within and the children as the children of God without. Now, it doesn't mean that unity is unanimity. It doesn't mean we're carbon copies. We're not just rubber stamps of even when we become more and more Christ-like, we are Christ-like as the individuals God has made us to be. And you just go back to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 uh, to catch that. It says, just as the body is one and has many parts, all the parts of that body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. So unity is not unanimity. We might not agree on everything. We might not look like each other. We might not like ways and practices of doing church but if we are saved we are church i want you to see the church it'll make a difference in your life it'll make a huge difference if you're not in that church it's because you're not saved so i invite you also to come to jesus and ask that he would put you into his church because it only happens one way and that's your salvation. Let us pray together. Father, thank you for your love and your grace, your power, your presence, your purpose, and Lord, for the church. Help us to know you, to serve you. In Jesus' name.